So this is the introduction to number theory. So a little bit more of that before we get into the public key. Public key is the chapter 9, but for public keys we need some more mathematics and that is in this one. So we talk about prime numbers for mass and Euler's theorem and then testing for primality, Chinese remainder theorem and discrete logarithms because all of these are required for, um, for the public key. So Fermat's theorem, Fermat has two theorems. So I think just to be clear, we are talking about Fermat's little theorem. Um, Fermat's little theorem is very simple. He says take any number and you take any prime, take any number and take any prime that number raised to p minus 1, a raised to p minus 1 will always be 1 mod p. Very strong. Take any number, take any prime, a raised to p minus 1 is always 1 mod p. And if you multiply both sides by a, a raised to p is always a. Okay, here's an example. Let's take p as 5. 5 is a prime number. So 1 raised to 5 minus 1 which is 4. So 2 raised to 4 is 16, mod 5 is 1, 3 raised to 4 is how much? You should be able to do that in your brain now because the exam is coming, <laughs> 81 and 81 mod 5 is 1, 4 raised to 4 is 16. 4 raised to 4, 2 is 16. 16, raised to 16 times 6, 16 is square. 256 mod 5 is 1. Right? And those are only 5 numbers in mod 5. So, you know, rest of them are already true, right? So, similarly, you can try with 7, you can try with, not, with, uh, with 11, 13, any prime number you know, this is true. And this would be true for obviously the lowest prime number. Is, I mean, I don't know if you want to call 1 as a prime number, but 2 is there too, 2, 3, they are prime, and you can repeat the same process. Then Euler's, Euler has a stronger result than Fermat. He said that there is a smaller number which he calls totient function. Totient function psi n, or phi n, sorry, phi n, that is the number of that is the size of the re reduced set of residues so if you write down the number from 0 to n minus 1 that is the complete set of residues residue means remainders when you do mod n arithmetic the remainder will be from 0 to n minus 1 right that is the complete set the size is n in the previous uh, theorem we had used p as the size. So if you had a mod p operation then the size would be p, right? So you are using n for whatever reason. Anyway, so, and p is mixed up again. Alright, so, but if you just take those residues which are relatively prime to n, which are co-prime, also called co-prime to n, then that set is smaller. So if you take for n equal to 10, this is the complete set, 0 through 9 but 2 is not co-prime to 10 because 2 and 10 have a common factor other than 1, right? 3 is relatively prime, 4 is not relatively prime, 5 is not relatively prime, 6 is not relatively prime, 7 is, 8 is not, 9 is, right? So overall only 4 numbers are relatively prime to 10, right? So the torsion function is 4. Torsion function of 10 is 4. If P is prime, then obviously everything is relatively prime. So if, if it was not 10, if it was let's say 11, then nothing has a common factor with 11, that side is prime, right? So the torsion function for 11 would be 10, we don't have a 0 there. Right, so torsion function for a prime is p minus 1. And if your product p and q, 
then the torsion function is the product of the p minus 1 and q minus 1. So let's see, torsion function of 37 is 36, obviously, because every number from 0 to 36, uh, actually 1 through 36, is relatively prime to 37. But 21 is not a prime number, it is 3 times 7, and therefore the torsion function for 21 is 3 minus 1 times 7 minus 1, which is 2 times 6 is 12. And you can verify that by writing all 21 numbers and seeing which are relatively prime. In fact, I mean, now you can go back to 10. You can calculate the number, how much? 10 is 2 times 5, 2 primes, right? So it would be 2 minus 1 times 5 minus 1. 4 is the torsion function. The interesting thing is that um, for all A's, a raised to psi n is 1. I mean, A raised to phi n is 1. So you don't really need to go all the way to P. This torsion function will give you a lower number. For example, you don't have to go to, obviously every number raised to 10, in the case of mod 10, at 10 minus 1, which is 9, would give you 1. But you don't need to go to 9, power 9, even power 4 will give you 1. So phi n. So for any a and n where GCD is 1, where these are basically relatively prime numbers, this one will give you 1. So a equal to 3, n equal to 10. So so we have n equal to 10, we know that the phi 10 is 4. If we take 3 raised to 4, we get 81 and we get 1 mod this. If we take a equal to 2 um, and n equal to 11, then they are only related to prime. So a equal to 2 and n equal to 10 uh, is, doesn't apply. But a equal to 2 and n equal to 11, they are relatively prime. Phi n is 10, 2 raised to 10 has one, is equal to 1. So you can verify that. Basically, so this is a stronger, basically slightly different than Fermat's little theorem. But basically, in Fermat's little theorem, you have to go all the way to p minus 1, here you can do with less than p minus 1. Euler's theorem simply says that a raised to phi n equal to 1 mod n, now n doesn't have to be prime, n could be product of primes, and if it is product of primes, you can calculate phi n, right, by subtracting 1 from each factor and then multiplying all of, all of them, right. So, so you can calculate phi n, and once you know phi n, then you can calculate any A where the A is relatively prime to N. All right, there, is, there are two or three more things we need, and one of the things is to check for primality, to make sure that we can check that this number is prime. Now, for a small number, it's very easy, but for large numbers, it's very difficult. So, Miller Rabin gave an algorithm which is stated here. And I have drawn this flow chart, this is not in the book, but I, I think this is, basically I, I drew it based upon my understanding of this algorithm. And um, so, so the idea is, if you have a large number n and you want to test it, you have to find three integers, k, sorry, two integers, k and q, such that 2 raised to k times q is n minus 1, because n is, if it is even number, obviously n is not prime. So n has to be odd number. If it is odd number, you subtract 1. If you subtract 1, you get an even number. Once you get the even number, you take out all the powers of 2. And um, so you get then basically a number q, which is given, which is clearly odd. Right? So you find n minus 1 equal to 2 raised to q, 2 raised to k times q. Now you select any random number A. So this is this test actually doesn't test for for it, it doesn't guarantee that you got the prime number. What it guarantees is that you didn't get a prime number. If the test fails, then you know that it was not a prime number. But if it passes, it simply says inconclusive. We don't know. So there are two outcomes. Composite means it's not a prime number are inconclusive. So far, whatever you have tested, it doesn't, we don't know whether it is prime or not. So you do it many, 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 many times, 
And if you have done it 100 times, you are kind of assured that it looks like it is a prime number. All right, so the test goes as follows. You, you take any number, random number A, any random number A, just generate a random number, we, we taught you how to generate a random number, and raise to Q mod N, and then calculate is it 1. If it is 1, then you stop right there, inconclusive. Take another A, go for another A. If it is not 1, then is it N minus 1? Yes, it is N minus 1, then inconclusive, stop right there. If it is not n minus 1, then you square it. Is that n minus 1? Yes, in conclusion. If it is not, then you stop. So basically, you keep doing this all the way to 2 raised to q minus 1. Um, and if that is n minus 1, then in conclusion, otherwise it is a composite. So to find the composite, you have to do lots of steps. But you might be able to get that this is we can't reach any conclusion with this A and therefore we should go back and select another A. Every time you select A, the probability that it is prime is after T test is 1 minus 4 raised to minus T. So every time is 1 fourth um, decreases, right? So if you do for example for T equal to 10, you do 10 numbers like this, the probability is 1 minus 4 raised to minus 10 4 raised to minus 10 is 2 raised to minus 20. So it's a very small number, right? A million, one in a million chance that it is it is not a prime. And, you know, and rest 5 and 9 is, is fine. This is good to be so much sure because generally we are talking about 100 digit numbers or 200 digit numbers, big numbers. And if you were to do brute force, you would be doing it forever. So you just take any 100 random numbers and then test it out with this method. This is something that is actually, you could even write a program. You should know this test because when you do public key, you need prime numbers like this, large prime numbers, 100 digit prime numbers. And um, so <coughs> you need to check them from primality, right? So this is the algorithm. This is something that is suitable for writing a program because many things we did and I said, you know, you don't need to write a program because there, particularly in the secret key stuff, everything was non-linear. Everything was tables, right? And you have to make, before you can write a program, you have to make, you know, 16 tables or 20 tables or 16 or 16 tables. Here, it's just the opposite. In the public key, as we are getting into public key, things are very mathematical. So, interestingly enough, there are no big tables to be seen. It's just you have to be able to do multiplication and division. So you can start writing programs. I think you should probably just remember this flowchart. So if I gave you an A, then you just square it. Sorry, A raised to Q, and then see if it passes. Okay. All right. Here's an example. So 29. You want to see whether 29 is prime number. So 29 minus 1, minus 1 is 28, which is 2 raised to 2 times 7. So k is 2 and q is 7. So we take any number between 1 and 29, or 0 and 29, obviously 1 would not be a very good number, but let's say we took 10. You raise 10 raised to 7, mark 29, and that's a lot of mathematics. Once you did that, it comes out 17. So it's neither n minus 1 nor 1. If it was 1, it would be inconclusive, and n minus 1, it would be inconclusive. So 28 would be inconclusive, and 1 would be inconclusive, right? That is the first part of the diagram here. a raised to q mod n is 1, a raised to q mod n is equal to n minus 1. It's not. <coughs> so we go to the next one, third, third branch. We square this number 17. Why 17 we square it? Because we want to now square this number by 2, and this is the same thing as squaring that number. So to go to 10 raised to 14, all we have to do is 17 square, right? And we do mod, and it comes out 28. So we finish the test in the third branch. 221, we do the same thing. 221 minus 1 is 220, which is 2 raised to 2 times 55. All right? So the main thing is this Q is what we have to raise every time. So if the Q is large, you have to raise to a large power. So we, let's say we randomly took A equal to 5. 
5 raised to 55 mod 221 that is 112 112 is not neither n uh, neither neither 1 nor n minus 1 so that doesn't do but um, we do a square of this and that is neither 1 nor n minus actually this is not n minus 1 either so that finishes the test because the test ends when you have done up to 2 raised to k minus 1 sorry this this letter here is k so in this example that we were doing k was equal to 2 and therefore 2 minus 1 is 2 so as long as you did this square you are at the end of the table right in both these examples k is equal to 2 and therefore all you do is square it and at that point you would get one of the two results either inconclusive or composite then we move on to the prime distribution is that uh, how many primes can you find in a given range as the numbers become bigger and bigger the prime becomes rarer and rarer and rarer right in the beginning there are lots of primes so this is the key thing is that the, the number of primes is close to the distance between the primes is close to log n natural log of n everybody knows what is the natural log right this e so this is natural log in practice you need to do 0.5 times log n numbers of size n to locate a prime so if you need a prime of 100 digits or so take natural log of 100 digits that is 200 it will come out more like 200 or 300 times 0.5 150 numbers will have to try out before you will get a prime obviously you won't be trying any even numbers but you will need 150 odd numbers and you will go through this test which we talked about a minute ago before you will find a prime and uh, that doesn't really guarantee this is 0 0.5 log n doesn't guarantee that you will find a prime it's quite possible that all those 150 turn out to be composite 